Um, Senator King, I also couldn't sleep Friday night. Um, and uh, I had a much shorter drive home than you did. It was only about 10 miles. But I got home and couldn't go to sleep either. And uh, it was because uh, I felt that I owed you an answer on Friday. Um, I felt like it is easy in issues this tense and this closely held to avoid the conflict rather than to walk into it. But I feel like if our friendship means anything, it means on the issues most deeply held to you, I ought to owe you an answer if we disagree. Um, and so, uh, so I want to say a few words about some of the points that you made and others have made. Um, and the first is I do want to say something about um, the people involved in this debate, and particularly about the folks uh, on this side of the chamber who have opposed this measure. Um, I want to say that, um, and apologies to Senator Roberts and Senator Marble, I may use the phrase guys because it describes the majority of you. Um, I want to say that one of the things that makes me proud to serve in this body uh, is that you are the type of men that escort the women members of our caucus out of the committee hearing on this bill to ensure their safety, even for a policy they've just voted for that you believe deeply against. You are the kind of people that if I ever find myself on Flight 93 or in Theater 9 or in Sandy Hook, I hope I look up and see these faces in that room. Uh, yeah, I read the great essay from Colonel Grossman, and you, uh, my friends, are in a world of sheeps and wolves. You are sheepdogs. Um, and I want to say thank you for that. Um, and so what is the question that we are asking here? Um, I think. The truth is that any society that holds more than one value holds no value absolutely. And that means that the sacred right to bear arms, just like the sacred right to freedom of speech, just like the sacred right to freedom of privacy, uh, has limits. Liberty curbs equality. Equality curbs liberty um, just in the way uh, that these rights are balanced against each other. And I think our lives and our laws now reflect that truth. We're not here debating today whether or not we have the right to bear an RPG or an M1 tank or a Black Hawk helicopter or a bazooka or the arms that might reasonably be required if we were going to require a well-regulated militia today to defend ourselves against foreign invasion. We made that decision when we established a professionalized army in this country. We made that decision when we supported policies that had America wage and win an arms race that made us the single superpower in the world. I think policies that made this country safer. But it means that it's no longer personally possible or fiscally possible for us to believe that every household in America can win an arms race against every foe. But I believe there is a different war that we are talking about today that is deeply important. And that is a war fought by the hollow men in this country, fought by the people whose emptiness is so deep that they try to fill it by finding senseless ways to cause pain in lives of the innocent. That's the war we're talking about here. And let's make no mistake, the defining characteristic of this war is that it is a war fought by cowards. Which means, Senator Brophy, they will never post on the website that they'd like to challenge us and meet us in the town square in Ray. Because they know that the number of Americans that would show up to fight that battle would be so vast, even the great eastern plains of Colorado probably couldn't fit them all. Now, they may be cowards, but they are not fools. Which means they will never fight this war in a place where we're ready or we're prepared. And the irony is, if they did, None of us would probably need more than a musket from the 18th century because 100 million Americans standing arm to arm shooting one round each would be plenty to mow down whichever cowards would show up at that fight. But that's not the way they're going to fight this. They're going to fight this not on the battlefields of America, but on the playing fields of America. They're going to fight this not in the times when we have an AR-15 and a couple of 60-round magazines in our pocket, they're going to fight it when we have a box of popcorn and a movie ticket in our hands. Or when we have a library book or a Disneyland pass. Those are the moments they're going to fight them. 
And that's a hard reality to face. Because that means in those moments, we are going to be outgunned. Because let me tell you, there was one debate that was heated around this issue, which is what if there were an SRO at Sandy Hook? Well, I can tell you we had an SRO at our school for five years. And that SRO carries a gun. He carries one gun. But the task of taking lives and the task of saving lives are fundamentally different endeavors, and they require different tools. Which is why on that SRO's belt, he also has a radio. He has tools of communication. He has tools of peace. He has a telephone. He has handcuffs. And you know what? He'd never have space to carry an AR-15 with him because he is going to spend 99% of his time doing what every adult in an elementary school does every day, which is putting Band-Aids on kids' knees and asking them how their day was and carrying them to class with their legs broken and ruffling their hair and probably playing some pickup basketball. The cost of living and loving is that it takes up so much space in our lives. It fills our hands. It fills our pockets. It fills our hearts. The hollow men have no such burden. Think of the man that walked into Theater 9 or into Sandy Hook. Every single ounce of his being is filled with hate. Every pocket is filled with ammo. Every shoulder is filled with a gun. Every hand is filled with another one. And unless we plan to put down all of the rest of the things we value to compete with him, unless we plan to hollow ourselves out so much that we also are that empty and have nothing else to carry, we will never walk into that battle as prepared as he is. Because when I walk into the Aurora Theater, and I do often, I have about seven pockets in my coats. And one of them's got a bottle, and one of them's got a pacifier, and one of them's got a snake book, and one of them's got a half-eaten fruit bar, and one's got a cell phone, and one's got my wife's car keys. And I hope that the next time I'm in one of those theaters that there is someone sitting next to me with a concealed carry permit. I do. That's why I had concerns about the bill on Friday. But even that man, even one of us in this chamber sitting next to me in Theater 9 with a concealed carry permit, when I walk into that theater, I'm hopefully holding two things. I'm holding a Coke, and I'm holding my wife's hand. I might drop that Coke for a concealed carry permit to pick up my gun. I'm never dropping my wife's hand, which means I always only got one hand to fight with. And he's always got at least two because he's got nothing to hold that's nearly as valuable as my wife's hand is. And so the bad news is, in that moment, we are going to be outgunned. The good news is, in America, that never means we're going to be outfought. Todd Beamer was outgunned on Flight 93. He won that battle. Jean Hassam at the New Life Church in Colorado Springs was outgunned. She had a simple 15-round magazine against a guy with an AR-15. She only needed 10 of those rounds to hit him and knock him down. You take my favorite story, the 74-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Badger at Gabby Gifford shooting. He was outgunned. He didn't even have a gun. But it didn't stop him from tackling the shooter and ending that massacre. Actually, he was, he was joined by a man, Mr. Zamudio, who actually had a concealed carry permit but didn't use it. Why? Because in the instant, he responded as fast as he could, and he just tackled him. He never got the gun out of the holster. And those moments being outgunned doesn't mean being outfought. It just means we need a chance to let American people be heroes. It means we need a chance. Because I think those folks that are willing to fight for their families are always going to fight harder than those that are willing to die for fame. So what I find the most shocking about the Newtown story, what broke my heart the most on that, is when the story broke at the end of the day, I couldn't believe it. There were no survivors. There has never been a mass shooting in America where there were no survivors. And you know the story no one wants to tell about that? Do you know why? It's because every single bullet mattered. Because he put the gun to the head of a five-year-old, execution style, one after another, and made sure he never missed. Senator Johnson, 30 seconds. Can I use, Mr. President, my next 10? You may. And so here's why that matters. We lost 26 people that day. Mr. Sherlock, whose wife died that day, the school psychologist testified that when he reloaded his 30-round mag, in that 11 seconds that he reloaded, 11 kids got away. You gave us that 11 seconds, and we prevented a, a body count of 26 from being 37. All we needed was that 11 seconds. 
And so the hard question to ask is, what if that were a 15 round mag? We could have picked 11 of those little five foot coffins and chosen not to fill them in that 11 seconds. Senator Brophy, I was invited to your party last year and I plan to come this year. Um, and when I come, I want to bring my boys. Um, and I think there is no place safer or more enjoyable, frankly, for them to shoot than with you on your farm. I think they'd love it. And I will be happy when this bill passes to make two stops on the way to that party. I will stop and buy Mrs. Brophy a bottle of wine, which I should, because I have at least a little bit of good home training. Um, and I will be happy to stop on the way to buy my own 10 round mag for my kids to use in your guns. And I have every bit of confidence that there will be on the market that magazine for me to buy in July in the same way that there is right now, because I too like to search online, Senator Brophy, the way that there is right now online a Glock 17, nine millimeter. You can buy right now, $499. It says right here at the bottom, choose your options. California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York models come with 10 round magazines. I believe in capitalism, it's a, it's a fierce thing which means I'm sure you will have that option on here to buy in Colorado a 15 round magazine. But what matters more than that is that when they get there and they get to shoot that gun, and I am sure the first 10 rounds that they shoot, nothing will come within a country mile of a watermelon. But when they for the first time unpack that first clip and in the 11 seconds, if I've trained them well, they'll look up and they'll give you a big smile and they will say thank you for letting them have this great fun experience for teaching them how to do it safely. That 11 seconds. All I'm saying is if in that same 11 seconds, somewhere else in this state, that buys a man like Steve King enough, enough time to clear his holster and take a shot at somebody, if that buys him enough time to even clear his head and take a swing at somebody, and that means we put 11 fewer kids in boxes in the next year or two years, that is an 11 seconds that I will trade. You're right, we can't get the kids back that we've already lost, but we can sure refuse to send them more. We can right now fight the increase in class sizes in heaven. We can do that. But it's going to take our ability to make a commitment on values, because this is a true dilemma. Dilemmas are when you have competing values on both sides. I am willing to trade the 11 seconds of that inconvenience for the 11 kids we don't have to bury. If we just one time give someone in this chamber or the next theater or baseball game or public gathering enough time to be a hero, we have seen over and over and over in this country, if you give the American people a chance, they will fight for us and they will keep us safe. We're not asking for it all. We're just asking for 11 seconds to give them a chance. I ask for an I vote.